All right. Thank you for your patience, everyone. Um, we had a little technical glitch, so we had to figure it out real quick, but we are here now. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us from all over the world. This is an amazing time in history and a very important conversation to be had and continued. Um, and first of all, I'd like to thank the extraordinary humans on the panel, um, Dr. Bruce Lipton, Andrea King, Reverend Michael Beckwith. Um, thank you guys so much for your time and your service and your just generous um, presence here. Uh, to start, I'm going to quickly run through some bios in case there's people on here that don't know any of you. Uh, and then we'll dive right into the conversation. So Andrea King um, has dedicated her life to serving humanity and supporting those who have been marginalized and silenced to find and collectively use their voice for change. A National Merit Scholar, she studied psychology at Emory University. Soon after college, she joined the Center for Democratic Renewal and organized the first national conference on hate crimes and hate violence. Andrea also helped organize marches and rally, rallies that led to the building of the Southern Co Coalition Against Racism and Bigotry. In 2006, she married Martin Luther King III, and they now have a 10-year-old daughter, Yolanda, who is an activist in her own right. Dr. Michael Beckwith is the spiritual director and founder of the Agape International Spiritual Center, a transdenominational community of thousands of local members and global live streamers. Highly regarded for its cultural, racial, and spiritual diversity, the late Coretta Scott King wrote to Beckwith, I greatly admire what you are doing to bring about the beloved community, which is certainly what my dear husband worked for and ultimately gave his life. Agape's community outreach and global outreach programs are doing incredible things for humanity here locally, in LA, and all over the planet. Thank you. Dr. Bruce Lipton, he is an internationally recognized leader in bridging science and spirit. He is a stem cell biologist, the best-selling author of The Biology of Belief, and recipient of the 2009 Goy Peace Award. In 1982, Dr. Lipton began examining the principles of quantum physics and how they might be integrated into his understanding of the cell's information processing systems. His discoveries, which ran counter to the established scientific view that life is controlled by the genes, led to one of today's most important fields of study, the science of epigenetics. Okay, so, um, Originally, we planned to bring Bruce Lipton on to talk about COVID and the pandemic, but obviously in light of recent events, we feel it's important that the conversation has shifted. Um, and I wanna start um, by just saying, you know, there's, this is a very sensitive conversation. It's an intense and very important time in history. Um, I'm actually just waking up to, um, you know, my white privilege and this subconscious belief system and systemic racism that pervades every institution and social construct in our country and beyond. And so um, I'm learning and um, I'm just, I'm grateful for all of you to contribute your wisdom, your experience uh, and help us to learn, you know, how to really understand the whole picture so that we can be the change. Um, you know, I thought I was a good one. I, I grew up in a very diverse culture in Long Beach, California. I was in the public school system. Um, whites and blacks were about equal. Uh, we were actually the minority in my public schools. I have so many black friends and and dear people in my life. I've been in Agape, you know, I've gone to Agape for the last 13 years. Uh, and so to become aware and to have this time where it's shining light up, uh, like I just was not aware of this systemic racism that, that pervades, like I said, every institution and, and social construct. So um, I think shining the light of awareness on that fact, uh, we can begin to heal and begin to really move forward with, with real progress and change. So that said, um, you know, I'm learning about the, 
there's been like the Chicago riots in 1990, the 1919, the Harlem riots of 1935 and 1943, the Watts riots in the 60s, Rodney King riots in, in 92. Um, we seem to be still, fa it's, it's so disheartening to know that there hasn't been the progress that, that we need in this country. So um, what, will this time be different, Michael and, and Andrea and, and, and Bruce and, and why? What, what, why is this time so crucial and what is different? Thank you, Kelly, for, for hosting this particular conversation at this time in human history. And it is a powerful conversation and a necessary conversation. And you mentioned the different uprisings, the different uh, protests, the different uh, riots. Uh, even when Dr. King was assassinated, there was a tremendous uprising throughout, throughout the United States. And what it appears to be different about this one is that uh, one, we have video cameras uh, that has shown consistently the uh, brutality and the racism and the abuse that uh, black people have um, experienced, particularly under uh, the uh, office of, of police officers. Whereas before it was often one word against another, um, uh, one man's word against another man's word. Here you have the uh, video cameras showing things that, that are actually going on. Also, what's different about this time is that you have everyone out. Uh, oftentimes, they would say it was a black protest. It was a black uh, a protest. But this time, everyone's out on the streets. White people, black people, Hispanics, LGBTQ community is, is on the streets. Our Asian brothers are on the streets. And it has gone through the borders of the United States, and it's in pretty much every country in the world, you know, Berlin, Australia, New Zealand, uh, France, uh, we can name all of these, all the countries who are rising up and saying this type of, this racism must be stopped and it must be stopped in their own countries as well. So I think, I mean, you're an example of it. I think people are listening now, whereas before people were saying, it's not affecting me, it's affecting someone else. I don't have to participate. I don't have to have the conversation. So I think uh, these particular factors are very, very important. Even the, um, the mainstream media over the years, which generally try to uh, paint the protest as violent uh, looters uh, that were basically blowing off steam, are now really beginning to share the story of the systemic violence that has happened to black and brown people. This, the, the mainstream news is reporting about the lies in today in the, in the New York Times. They ran an article about when police officers lie and they had many, many cases where the video showed one thing, but the police report showed something else. So you wouldn't get this before. This was, it, this never rose to the, to the level of the mainstream media. So I think all of these things have come together to push the needle forward uh, to First of all, be aware that there's racism. I mean, black and brown people, we've always known it was here. We've experienced it. But for the rest of the population to know it and then begin to uh, find ways to deconstruct it and to find ways to bring justice. Racism is how you feel about me. Justice is how you treat me. So there's a two different issues. There's racism and then there's justice. And uh, historically, uh, people of color have been under the iron foot of racism, but also justice has not been the same as well. Um, I, I, I'll, I'll let that be my opening remarks. I don't wanna, we have two other panelists, but that's just the, my beginning of the conversation. Thank you. Well, um, first of all, I'd like to thank my fellow panelists for being here this evening. I'm looking forward to a very robust um, and healing conversation and certainly to all of the people that are join, joining in the conversation from all over. Um, I would like to, to piggyback a bit on Reverend Michael's um, comments. And I wanna go back a little bit farther because in the early nineties, I worked for an organization um, called the Center for Democratic Renewal, which was actually the former National Anti-Klan Network. And as part of that um, organization, we monitored hate groups such as the Ku Klux Klan, neo-Nazis, these, and go into 
then help communities to organize when these particular groups and or when hate crimes happen um, in that area. And again, this was the, the middle 90s. And I just remember vividly, it would be about 420 um, anti-Klan um, demonstrators and 200 Klansmen and neo-Nazis and, you know, you know, really they're taunting us. And then I, I started noticing about three or four years ago that there was starting to be a shift. And I would see the, the, when the Klan would come and I would see it on the news, I'm no longer in that, that particular arena so intimately, there would be five or six Klansmen and 500 people saying no. And that to me was such a huge difference from what I experienced working um, on, on the issues of hate crimes and hate groups. So I think that there was a, the beginning of an awakening. Um, and I think it has been happening little by little by little over the last five or six years. We also started seeing more activism than we had seen um, ever before or in the last few years, whether it's the Me Too movement, Time's Up, um, the Women's March, the March for Our Lives, where you had 800,000 young people you know, in Washington and, and marching all around the country. So I think that we were starting to see a shift, a shift in consciousness, an expansion. And that's why I believe in the depths of my soul that, that this time is different, that this time it, it will take. Um, how long that, how long, I don't know, but I certainly believe if not in, in my lifetime, my daughter who just turned 12 or her children's lifetime, we really will see the, the creation of the beloved community in which my father-in-law saw so vividly and spoke and worked, uh, um, worked on and worked to create. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Bruce, do you want to? Uh... Yes, I would love to participate because this is an important time, as we've just heard from these distinguished friends of mine. And uh, why is it important from my point of view as a biologist? This is something else that goes beyond uh, social understanding. There's a fundamental biological reality that we're facing right now. And what we're facing is called the sixth mass extinction of life on this planet. Five times in the history of the planet, life was thriving and some cataclysmic event wiped out up to 90% of life each time. The last time, 66 million years ago, uh, we flushed forests and woods and dinosaurs all over the place. Uh, comet hits near Mexico, wipes out 90% of life, and we started all over again. Well, today we're in the sixth mass extinction, and what's the most important thing we have to understand is that human behavior is creating the sixth mass extinction. And that says we have not been living in harmony with ourselves. We've been not been li harmony, living in harmony with the planet. And as a result, the behavior that we have been playing at over all this time has precipitated uh, an extinction process that uh, humans are going to be involved in, not a thousand years from now, but within decades. The collapse of civilization is already anticipated. Uh, NASA did research a few years ago and showed this is the end of industrial civilization. And he goes, so what? And I go, all the frailties, all the problems that have kept us from surviving and thriving into the future are now coming to the surface. We have economic upheaval. We have religious upheaval. We have uh, COVID upheaval, uh, climate change. Uh, and now the biggest one is this racial issue. And the reason that it has to come up now is you cannot succeed and move into the future and thrive living the way we've been living because we have not honored ourselves or honored this planet. And when we really get to understand something which is new for me in the sense that I, I wasn't a spiritual person until the research revealed uh, the connection that uh, quantum physics reveals that we are an energy playing through this system. And when people have to recognize this, the body is just a, a, a virtual reality suit. All of us are energy spirits. And, and the fact is that we come back again and again because we're a field. And I say, why? 
Well, this time you might be a woman, next time you might be a man. This time you might be white, next time you might be black. Uh, uh, these are vehicles. Who are we? We're bigger than that. We're spiritual entities. And the relevance is we have not understood who we are. We have been programmed to be afraid. Uh, and fear is what promotes the problems. You know, having from Jewish ancestry, you can go back to World War II and talk about, hey, things weren't working good. Who's the problem? The Jews are the problem. And that, once we focus on that, then everybody, you know, that's where it went. Where's the problem today? Oh, black people are a problem. Whoever it is, you wanted to find somebody. That is the nature of a leadership that leads by fear. And the idea is this is time for this to end because this is our ending as a civilization if we do not change. And so for me, I'm so excited that this movement is picking up. And But more excitement for me is to maintain this movement because now we're starting to move. Now we have momentum. Now people can start to make the laws rather than some high and mighty mucky muck somewhere. It's time for us. And the public is now wakening up to the reality that we have not been living true human life. We haven't been expressing humanity. Humanity is the passion and compassion and the spiritual nature of who we are. The, today's world with the strife, whether it's racial or religious, whatever it is, is all a symptom of we are not surviving and that we need to change this. So I'm very thankful, not for the problems that have caused the upheaval, but for the maintenance and globalization of the response because it says people all over the world are recognizing we can do better. We can actually create the intention of what a human is. Mm -hmm. and, and we're not really doing very well at that right now. Uh, but the reality is it's coming. Why? Because it needs to be a public dialogue big enough to be heard. And today's global expression of the outrage of this murder and many of the murders that have happened over and over and over again and covered up by a cover of blue that this is what they do, it's time to end. And and it's and, and it's all of us. And, and it's not that the police are evil, is they just have programming and we've all been programmed. And it's time to rewrite those programs, programs that will sustain love and health and happiness and community. Otherwise, Six mass extinction is here, folks. This is why all the chaos is going on. So this is not an accident. This is a fundamental element of necessary evolutionary change. Bring up the problems to the surface right, right. so we can move forward into the future. So uh, that's from a biological point of view. Right, right, right. I love it. Yes. Michael, do you want to say something? Yeah, I, 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 two, two things. One. Things are coming to the surface, and I would say, and I think Bruce would agree with me, that for the last 40 years, the, the, the power of, of expanding field through meditation has been happening. And, and when you have a field that's been generated, it, it lifts a veil. It's an apocryphal moment. The word apocalypse means the veil is being lifted so we can now see the systemic issues that people were blind to before. So a lot of what's arising is not simply because of the negativity that was there. A lot of the problems are arising because our consciousness has raised based on the, the individuals who have been holding the high watch in prayer and in meditation. They've actually allowed us to see what was hidden before. Now we can deal with it. So when you combine an expanded field of individuals who've been meditating for years, you combine the, the, the fatigue of, of black and brown and oppressed people, even poor people who have been oppressed for a period of time and the, not, and, 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 and the, and the energy of, we're not gonna take this anymore, along with the lightning rod of George Floyd being publicly executed. When you put all three of those things together, there's a tremendous opening. So I, I agree with, with Bruce that we're in an evolutionary movement that, and there's so much systemic issues that are rising to the surface. But a lot of what's being made seen is because of the spiritual work that's been done in the background. So this is an apocalypse in which we're coming to an end of a world, an end of a world view. The veil is lifted so we can see. And so now, uh, as you were talking, uh, Kelly, uh, you're beginning to have a, an education 
on what groups of people have been living with for years and people didn't even know it. They heard about it, they read about it, saw it in the news every now and then. Every so often there was an uprising, there was a riot, and there was a protest. But now people are seeing that this has been systemic. It's in society, it's in corporations, it's in the school system. It's how people treat each other consciously and unconsciously. So uh, I just wanted to bring in the fact that, as, as Bruce knows, you know, we all generate a field. We're all, uh, you know, quantum physics. We're, we're a field, and the field has gotten so rich that certain things can't be hidden. And then when you have an evolutionary trigger like number 45, who's occupying the White House, he assisted in allowing us to see what was be, what was invisible before. So even though uh, the individuals are uh, that that rose up with the supremacist attitude are reclining, they rose up boldly because of his ability to to, to dog whistle them out, so to speak. Yeah. So we're in a, in a moment in which we now can see what's being hidden, so we can deal with it. If you have a disease in your body temple, and you and I talked about this earlier, Kelly. And if you just ignore it, it doesn't go away if you ignore it. You have to go in and actually uh, uh, participate in your own healing. And so the individuals that are on the street are providing the context for us to participate in the healing of the psychic scar tissue that has been within us for so long and to do it at different levels. This is just the first level. This is the first level, protest, acknowledgement. But there's levels of strategy, there's levels of vision, there's levels of implementation. All of those levels are next. Yeah. Yes. And I feel like, you know, it's it's 2020 and everybody was so excited to come into the year 2020. It's clear vision and 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 that's part of it. It's like it's to me, it's this like beautiful, divine, perfect storm of chaos where we have COVID that just shut the world down in fear and join the world together. And, you know, people said, oh, this is a global pause so we can reconnect to ourselves and see where our treatment of others and of ourselves and of the planet have not been sustainable. Um, so it's this rehumanization. And then, you know, then Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, all of this, you know, we're now like in our homes, people are have lost their jobs, their lives have been upended. And we're now like, okay, and, and only the fear that gripped this whole world was then trumped by this emotion that erupted, for lack of a better word, excuse me. Yeah, uh, it's a good uh, word. You know, <laughs> and it's just so fascinating to see because people are commenting, what happened to COVID? You know, because there's thousands of people in the streets next to each other. It's like when you're that charged up and when you have an intention and a, and a purpose, it's like, mm -hmm that other, the fear just falls away. So it's, I don't know if anyone wants to speak to that. Yeah. Well, you know, um, um, in 1968, I believe, a few months before he was assassinated, Martin Luther King wrote his last book and it's entitled, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community? And the very last chapter, the very last thing that he wrote was, um, entitled The World House. And it was really the analogy of all, all of us inheriting a house and having to, because we're in, interdependent, having to find a way to live together in this house without destroying it totally. I've long believed that in order to get to the community part that he asked about, we would have to go through chaos. Sometimes what looks like chaos really is a reordering and a restructuring so that we can through that and actually get to to community and I again I believe that's what we are what we're witnessing in such a magnified way and everything that led up to this prepared the stage from from COVID to the back-to-back -back, um, murders of Ahmad and Brianna and then li literally seeing George Floyd not only being executed before our eyes but narrating his death I think that the audio component as well to what was going on yeah. totally wrenched not everyone's heart who heard it and actually pierced literally the ethers and shake what whoever was left asleep that just shook everyone awake i've seen a lot of beautiful signs um over the last week but my favorite 
is that all mothers were summoned when George Floyd called for his mama. Right. And to me, what that means is, yes, it's talking about those of us who have birthed children, but it's, it's, very, it's deeper than that to me. This, that part of us that is nurturing, that is the divine feminine, that is the God, the feminine part of the God essence. It's like those cries pierced the very ethers and all of our souls were summoned to answer the call. Right. Totally. That, that, is, that, that is where we are right now. Absolutely. Couldn't have said it better. Yeah. The, the chaos that is here, it's real interesting because chaos is sometimes perceived to be random. But chaos, actually, there's a plan in it, but you can't see it because so much is going on. That's chaos. And there is a plan. So very simply this. <clears throat> Let's compare current civilization to a caterpillar. Caterpillar is a very voracious organism. It destroys the environment. If you put a caterpillar on a plant, it'll eat every leaf off of that plant. But when it reaches its size, what does a caterpillar do? It goes into a cocoon. I say, what's going on in that cocoon? I say, there's a breakdown of a caterpillar, but there's also simultaneously the buildup of the butterfly. The butterfly is the light touch. The butterfly is the one that lives in harmony with the planet. And it's interesting because our civilization has been like the caterpillar, very destructive of everything, the environment, of the people in the environment. It's falling apart. And the important part about it is this. You cannot build the sustainable civilization on the foundation where the problem is. You have to bring it down and then build something up. So the chaos is watching something come down while simultaneously something is being built. <clears throat> and it depends on which side you want to focus on. Because if you focus on the stuff coming down, it's like, oh my God, this thing's coming down. But if you start to focus on the side of what are we building up, and this is what Michael and Andrea were both talking about, yeah, there's a coming down for sure, and a necessary coming down. If it doesn't come down, we're in a lot of trouble. But the building up is what we want to focus on. So if we focus on all the stuff coming down and the problems over there, we're really misdirecting our energy. It's our consciousness has to go toward what are we going to do from here to right. create the sustainable, thrivable future that we're capable of doing. And just to close that, uh, it's important to recognize that the evolution, this is an evolution, it's a fact of evolution. We hit the end, we hit the wall, we're going extinct. You've got to do something different. And what's interesting about the evolution, it's not physical. We're, we're they gonna be the same physical body. It's a consciousness evolution as Michael brought up. We are changing the way we think and the way we live. And so it's interesting because that can happen very quickly. And we're precipitating a movement toward that right now. And that's why uh, the work of Andrea and Michael is to bring the love back into the system so that we can build the sustainable world. So when I look at it right now, I can say, oh my God, the thing's falling apart. But I can also look and say, I can see the roots, the seeds, the development of this sustainable world by responding to the problems that we've covered up for years and say, you cannot get out of here until you clean up this mess. And this is a cleanup time. Mm -hmm. And I'm very honored to be with all of you. And all of, I just want to acknowledge all of the people out there that are listening to us. I want to thank every one of you because by definition, you're a cultural creative. You're looking for answers outside of the box because the answers are not inside the box. That's the first problem. And, and that you're here, uh, we are honored, so honored that you are taking your time to hear some of this because knowledge is power and the power we need now to move is the new knowledge of love, harmony, spirituality, all that kind of beautiful stuff. And so uh, thanks for being here. Uh, and uh, we so are so honored that you're taking your time. Thank you. Absolutely. Just uh, as, as Bruce is speaking about chaos and Andre is speaking about chaos, a way of looking at it, the way I look at it is the layman's understanding of chaos is if you can step back far enough from chaos, you'll see an underlying harmony that's trying to emerge. Absolutely. And saying, it's tearing down the previous structures. So we're in that uh, chaotic movement now where uh, the chaos is giving way to a higher order. However, at our stage of evolution, we have to participate in that order that's emerging. 
It's not going to just happen. It's going to happen just according to our consciousness. So we have to participate. So, so this is why our inner work is extremely, extremely important. The other thing that I, that I want to embrace in this moment, I see that we have on, on the page where individuals can donate to Black Lives Matter. And sometimes there's a controversy around that statement. And we want to, we want to dissolve that controversy. It's uh, when we say Black Lives Matter, the way we can look at it is Black Lives Matter also, because historically they have not mattered. In the Constitution, a black man was three fourths of a man, and there needed to be amendment for a, 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 an African American to be considered a fully human being. So systemically, racism and the lack of justice has been built into the system because the beginning narrative was that we were subhuman. That subhuman narrative was necessary to rationalize turning human beings into slaves and to consider them no better than a cow or a horse. And I love cows and horses, um, but to consider them at that level, so to speak. So, so, in, so, in, sub, so in substance, uh, when someone says Black Lives Matter, that does not mean other lives don't matter. It simply means that historically, Black lives have not mattered where white lives have mattered. So sometimes you'll see people scream out, no, all lives matter, all lives matter, and they're missing the point. They've lost the plot, they're tone deaf. It means black lives historically have not mattered and we want our lives to matter as much as anybody's lives has mattered. The other uh, point of controversy that arises in this dialogue is that uh, individuals are trying to um, pin a medal on, uh, uh, on, on George Floyd or make him a saint or something like that. And again, that can be further from the truth. We're not concerned with what with, 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 um, certain justice departments do at times is that they dehumanize a person, then they criminalize the person in order to justify what they did to the person. So we're not saying that George Floyd was a saint or a sinner. Everybody has mixed backgrounds. We're saying that he was publicly executed. And whatever he did, if he did anything, did not deserve capital punishment and did not deserve capital punishment by a police officer who was simply supposed to arrest him. And so sometimes individuals will miss the plot. They'll miss the point and they'll run off and misunderstand Black Lives Matter or they'll misunderstand why people are, are allowing uh, the, the, the love of George Floyd to, to be risen. No, George, Floyd, George Floyd's life was a sacrifice, and the word sacrifice means to make sacred. In other words, his death, capital punishment, public lynching, um, basically set a fire and a, raised a light so that we can see that this kind of behavior was not relegated to just to George Floyd. So we wanna make sure that the narratives don't get lost. Black Lives Matter means Black Lives Matter also. And we're not talking about George Floyd's past. We're talking about the fact that he was publicly executed, which is allowing the needle to be pushed forward towards the deconstruction of racism and the deconstruction of injustice and the beginning of the conversations for many people about what white privilege has been. Example, I spoke about this at Agape yesterday. Uh, my godson, young white man, young white boy, 15, was 15 years old at the time, um, snuck and took his father and mother's car while they were sleeping. Went and picked up three of his friends, all white, and they're driving around, joyriding, but also doing some photography and things of that particular nature. They're pulled over by the police. The police asked him, do you have a license? Obviously, he doesn't have a license. He's 15. His parents didn't know he had the car. The police says to him, okay, go home. Now, as an African-American man, we know that if a young teenage, young four black teenagers were driving around in a car that they didn't have any business to be driving and had no license, they would have got their first time fingerprinting and handcuffed and got a record. And so his mother, so when he got home, his mother said, you're definitely in trouble for taking the car, but we want you to know what white privilege is. The reason those police officers sent you home rather than arrest you 
is because you're white. And so my godson, William, got an education about white privilege. So this particular time in human history is also allowing that conversation to happen. You know, that conversation, it began to happen a little bit when the, 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 the very rich people were trying to sneak their um, kids into college by paying people to get them into college. That was kind of a privileged act as well. But now the conversation is becoming more rich. People are having uh, powerful conversations at Agape. We're hosting a conversation called Say Their Names Tonight. Uh, it's already full, no one else can get in it. So we're gonna have another one on Saturday. So this particular moment is a moment of history making. And we have to ask ourselves, as I asked the congregation yesterday, are we gonna participate in it, in this moment of chaos and, and allow something else to emerge? Or are we gonna be a bystander? This is not the time to be a bystander. And I can see by all the people who are joining this conversation, as Bruce said, they're cultural creators. They don't wanna be bystanding. They wanna be a part of the conversation that's gonna to lead to right action. And so I, I, as has already been said, I thank everyone for joining in the conversation and hopefully we can continue to bring some clarity to what's occurring. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Clarity, light. Um, one of the biggest ahas I, I got when making the film Heal was from uh, the brilliant Bruce Lipton here. And when I learned about subconscious programming, um, and from you know our childhood, we are programmed with beliefs that aren't even ours, and they are subconscious. We are not aware that we have them. And so as I wake up to this concept of white privilege that I was oblivious to, or so comfortable that I, I didn't you know go out of my comfort zone to, to learn prior to last week, um, embarrassingly. And, and now, you know, for the people that, still are feeling uncomfortable with this term white privilege or not a like the education watching the movie 13 by Ava DuVernay that that shows the the political drive the the systemic problem in one area of society and it it's pervading every institution based on this belief that whites are superior to blacks and so it, it you have to educate yourself um, to bring this subconscious belief that's literally driving is in the in woven into the foundation of this country and once we bring it to light that's when we can start to heal and shift our consciousness and then shift our society hopefully um andrea you've you've actually worked with changing legislation and getting you know stuff passed and and done what like i get so overwhelmed because the system is so sick because our lobbying system and um government and, and, and politics are so corrupt in, in so many ways. Do you feel, based on your experience, um, what, 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 what can you speak to or what words of advice can you gather people together to use the power of their vote or to demand legislative change to make real progress and change happen? Um, I think we must demonstrate to legislate. I think that demonstrations are a very important part of change. And it has been so heartwarming to literally see all of the thousands and literally millions of people all over the world that are out and saying that they want change. And that certainly is one part and it's an important part. But I think that voting, you we have we have to vote. We have to find ways in which, you know, all of us have different strengths, different talents, different goals. Some of us, it might be, you know, going out and marching. For some of us, it might be signing a petition. For some of us, it might be that they have, you know, they want to run for public office. For some, it's really finding viable solutions in different ways. For some, it might be starting an education program for children. For some, it might be authoring a book. I think that there are so many viable strategies. What I do think is that each of us have our own unique way of contributing. And once we're, we're doing that, and once we're also are seeking, seeking and looking for justice, you know, it's been said that justice is what love looks like in the public arena. And when we are all finding ways to show up and, you know, Martin Luther King and Coretta Scott King talked a lot about the beloved community, which, you know, I've mentioned before. I firmly believe that the beloved community is created by each of us being loved. Mm -hmm. And 
we do that and not love and sentimentality, but certainly love that it adds agape in its highest level. And once we are tuning into our own power, our own talents, we will know and be led what it is our part to do. For some of us, it will be to go in a system. For some of us, it will be maybe you know to, to look at legal strategies or to be an attorney or to be a judge. For some of us, it's community activism. You know, it's, there's a lot of conversation now about defund, defunding the, the police. And, and that conversation has been skewed a bit because it's not about taking, you know, just taking and making a lawless society or making you know, there are no police officers. What the conversation is about is taking some of the funds that are used for policing a community to saying, hmm, maybe let's take some of these funds and put it into particular programs and social services so that we can prevent having to need as much policing. So they're already some of the best thinkers out there, I, you know, and people we have yet even heard of that are all coming and bringing their own unique talents, their own unique gifts. And that's all of the people that are joining us here tonight. You know, this change that we're talking about, it's not up to Kelly and Reverend Michael and Bruce and Andrea. And, you know, this is about all of us doing our part every day in making sure that justice is a way of life for everyone. And also, I would like to say it's something that you have to put on every day. You Just like, you know, we are a proud Agape family here in Atlanta. So we stream, you know, Reverend Michael just about every Sunday that that we're that we're home and even while while we're traveling. And as brilliant as he is, you know, probably by six o'clock that afternoon. I uh oh. Uh oh. You froze, Andrea, as right after you said as brilliant as I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right well well she's going to come back and I'll, we're going to let her continue yes. at that point but i wanted to add demonstration legislation there has to be a, a working of the changing of the narrative and so i i i tell people um one i i want my white brothers and sisters to talk amongst themselves about how they will deconstruct um racism because black people aren't going to deconstruct racism mexicans aren't going to deconstruct racism our lgbtq um, brothers and sisters aren't going to deconstruct homophobia that's going to come from other people working and so the conversations need to be had um, and, and interestingly enough the way the universe works is that when you ask a question the answer does come in many ways uh, so I, I, I always invite my my white brothers and sisters as kelly's doing to, to, to go on a research project. I mean, um, Jane Fonda was on a program recently. She's very progressive, but she said that she was sorely lacking in just how systemic the issue was. So she started studying, she started reading the books. She started bringing herself up to a greater awareness of what was happening. And she's talking to her friends about it. it, it and sometimes it's a pleasant conversation. Sometimes it's unpleasant because sleeping people sometimes don't want to be disturbed, but, but so uh, white brothers and sisters have to talk about that. I say to my uh, people of color, <clears throat> the work has to be done so deeply that the scar tissue and the wounds have to be healed through the power of forgiveness. So that even though an individual may have been victimized, they no longer are wearing the label of being a victim. They, are, they're, they're, they have to do the work so well within themselves, not bypassing it, but ferreting out the lies that they told that they believed about themselves, about inferiority, about lack, limitation, not good enough, not worthy, et cetera, so that they become impervious to the slings and arrows that come at them because of the color of their skin. So if my white brothers and sisters are having the conversations among themselves as to how we're gonna deconstruct it, the people of color are working on themselves to eliminate the scar tissue and, and come to an understanding that history began way before our individuals were slaves and that our white brothers and sisters have a lineage to abolitionists, not just the slave owners. Then the third part of that conversation is we talk to each other, we fall in love with each other. In other words, Dr. Howard Thurman once said, 
To say that you love humanity is meaningless. It's abstract. Humanity has a face. Humanity has a color of the skin. Humanity has ethnicity. You can't say you love humanity if you're not loving the people right in front of you, the people that you interact with in the, in the store, in the market, walking down the street. Uh, and this is why one of the reasons why Agape was formed, so that humanity can meet each other. Black, white, straight, gay, uh, whatever generation you were in, old, young, so that we actually meet each other, pray together, love together, walk together, class together, so we see through the familiarity that inside we really are the same, uh, regardless of sexual orientation, regardless of color of skin. So you can't love humanity in general. You have to love humanity in particular. And so uh, these are the ways that we begin to build the beloved community. And it's interesting that uh, Andrea is talking about that because uh, as you read that letter, Kelly, Coretta Scott King came to Agape when her daughter Yolanda joined Agape. And Yolanda was an avid member of Agape International and it shit sockways through the Baptist community because her father, great grandfather, her grandfather, great grandfather all came from the lineage. And when she joined Agape, her mother had to fly to LA to see what was going on. And Coretta Scott King sat in the front row and listened to what I had to say and wrote me that beautiful letter that you read an excerpt from uh, Kelly. And Yolanda was with us. We were very close friends. Uh, and right before that, Rosa Parks came to Agape. And she had told uh, Coretta of, about what we were doing, seeking to, to build the beloved community. So we have to love each other in particular. We can't be in silos of, of not interacting with each other. We have to be together. And those conversations must be had. Andrea, you got cut off at a certain point right after you said, as brilliant as Michael Beck was in. <laughs> <laughs> and then you 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 got stuck. <laughs> it was one of my one of my best. <laughs> uh oh. Saying that in our house, we uh oh. Hello. You're there, you're there. Hello? Yeah. Okay. In our house, we stream agape no matter where we are. But we also re-listen to it throughout the week. We don't just listen to it on Sunday and say, you know, because by six o'clock that evening, as, as wonderful and beautiful as the service is, you maybe have forgotten a little bit of what it is that you, you need to remember, even though you know it on a cellular level. And I believe that that's what we all need to do as we are incarnating into this, into this new world. We have to consciously every day put on love. Yeah. You have to put on righteousness. You have to put on looking and seeking justice. It is a daily occurrence. It's not something that you do once a week or, or once in a while. It's something that we have to commit to doing every day. Yeah, I like to say it's not a sprint. It's not even a marathon. It's a way of living. Yes. It becomes our way of living, checking ourselves, looking at our conversations, going, doing the deep inner work and seeking to bring more kindness and compassion onto the planet. It's, it's a way of living that we're inviting uh, all and of it's us. Very, it's very interesting, Michael, because uh, what you're talking about is really, if we get down to the core, is really all quantum physics. You go, oh, yeah. my, what the hell does quantum physics have to do with this? Uh, and the answer is very simple because, number one, it's the most valid, truthful science on this planet. There is no science that's been tested more or verified more as truthful than quantum physics. And I say, so why is it relevant? Because the first principle of quantum physics is consciousness is creating our life experience. If you change your consciousness, you change your life experience. You know, and you say, well, positive thinking, and everybody go, oh, yeah, placebo effect, positive thinking. I heal myself with what I thought was a the healing pill turns out to be sugar, but I healed myself because I believed in healing. And while people talk about the positive effects of placebo, we don't really mention that negative thinking is called the nocebo effect, and it could do everything. It, you can die from just the thought. Of dying yeah. negative thinking is equally powerful to positive thinking but it works in the opposite direction now the question is what are we thinking <laughs> and then it comes down to a very important insight so if I can just try and put in a little nut here and summarize it number one is this 
uh, a brain is like a computer. Uh, and a child's brain has an operating system working in the last trimester of pregnancy. It's already working. And I say, so what? I say, go out to the store, buy a computer, bring it home, push on, it boots up, operating system. And now I say, do something. And you go, oh, I, I have to put programs in. Then I could do something. Well, it turns out the child's brain has got an operating system last trimester of pregnancy. And for the first seven years of that child's life, it is a download of program. I say, how, where do the programs come from for a child that you have to become a member of a family, you have to be a member of a community, you have to know the rules, I mean, thousands of rules. I say, how does a child learn this? And the answer is, for the first seven years of that child's life, the brain is in a lower vibration than consciousness when you put wires on a person's head, EEG. It's called theta. Theta is hypnosis. So I say, well, where does a child get programs? I say, for the first seven years of its life, it observes the mother, the father, the family, and the community and downloads their behavior. And I say, these become the fundamental programs. And I say, after age seven, an individual has an opportunity to then be creative with the program. But the problem is this, and this is the most critical thing I can tell you right now, is yes, our consciousness is creating the world, but where's your consciousness coming from? The conscious mind, which is the latest evolution with creativity, wishes, desires, the things that we want? Or is it coming from the subconscious programs that were installed before age seven? And the point is very clear. 95% of our life is coming from the program. We have wishes and desires to create happiness and joy and health and all that, but that works 5% of the day. 95% comes from the program. I go, why is it relevant? Because the programs didn't come from us. They were passed down generation to generation to generation. And then 95% of your day is that program. This is what led the Jesuits for 400 years. They said, give me a child until it is seven, and I will show you the man. I said, what, what does that mean? The programming occurs in the seven years. Give me the child so I can program it. And then 95% of the life of that child is the program. So you become the program. And we've all been programmed. Now, the issue is this. A baby is not racist. <laughs> a, right, baby right. Has, a baby is love until programs come in. Right, right. And I say, where do they get the programs from? I say, from their parents who got it from their parents who got it from their parents. It's passed down for generations and generations. People think it's like genetic because it runs in family. I go, no, it's programming that runs in family. And I say, why? And here's the problem for most people. <clears throat> We only are using the creative wishes and desires of peace, love, all the things that we are talking about. The average person, 5% of the day, 95% comes from the program. And we don't see the program. I say, why not? Because why are we playing 95% from the program? And the answer is because when the conscious mind is thinking, it's not looking out, it's looking in. And therefore, if I'm driving the car and I have a thought, all of a sudden I'm not looking out the window anymore. But I'm still driving the car and go, don't worry, you've got a subconscious that's got a program, drive the car. You can drive the car without paying attention, no problem. But the issue is this. We do not see our programs when we play them. I said, what do you mean? I said, story for 30 years, same story in lecture. I'm going to look for a new one, but I haven't found it yet. And that is this. You have a <laughs> friend, you know your friend's behavior very well, and you know your friend's parent. And one day you see your friend has the same behavior as their parent. So you want to tell your friend, you go, hey, Bill, you're just like your dad. And I say, back away from Bill. He's going to go ballistic. How can you compare me to my dad? And the, the, this is the most profound story for this moment. And that is this. Everyone else can see that Bill behaves like his dad. The only one who doesn't see it is Bill. I go, well, how come? Because he's not paying attention when the program is playing 95% of the day. And 70% of the programs that we acquire are disempowering, self-sabotaging, and limiting beliefs. A child, a baby is not a racist until it is programmed to be a racist. And then when it's programmed to be a racist, does it mean it's going out every day saying, let's be a racist? I say, no, 95% of every day is just automatically playing the damn program. And it's interesting because I'm not a very religious person, but what are Jesus' last words? Well, here's why they're so relevant. Last words was, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And then I'm going to tell you, it's just like Bill. 95% of the day, he doesn't even know what the hell he's doing. He's playing programs. 
and it's not him. He's the five percent. And I say the problem out there in the world is we've been passing on racism, religious hatred, and everything in fear, and therefore we can blame somebody for something and not be responsible. And then I go, but the people who are doing it, they don't, they're not even conscious. They're playing programs. And, and this is where we have to wake up uh, and, and start to recognize <laughs> we are creating this world. And as Michael said, the evolution is not the evolution of our body. It's the evolution of our creativity. And this is what's happening right now. It's coming to the forefront. Right, saying, right. You know, your programs are <laughs> your programs are not helping here anymore. Uh, and can you even see your program? That is the harder part as well. Absolutely. And people run in this. And it's interesting because I gave this talk in, in uh, Tel Aviv. And we had an audience of uh, Arabs that are from the West Bank, never even came into Israel before. We had about 500 Arabs in there and about 1,000 Israelis in there. And I got to the point of the programming and everything. And I say, here's your problem. And I show two pictures on the screen. One picture is Arab kids dressed in military uniforms with wooden guns marching. And the other picture was Israeli kids playing with machine guns. And I said, this is programming. You've already programmed these kids. They, they don't even know who, who the other person is, but they're going to get them. Who are they? I don't know who that person is, but when I find out who he is, I'm going to get him. And I say, where did that come from? It was not genetics. It's actually the antithesis of biology because biology is not competition. Biology is cooperation. And we have been misprogramming children from generation to generation. A famous book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. It says right. what? If you came from a rich family, the first seven years give you programs to stay rich, even if you're stupid. Okay, uh, and the idea is if you come from a poor family, no matter how hard you try, your programming doesn't support you to get out of poverty. And I go, my God, all of our issues are this from children who have been programmed and manifesting these in their older life right now without even knowing what the hell they're doing. It's a wake up call. And I'm so glad that you were all here because uh, Andrea, I have it. Uh, heard your work directly and being there, but I know of your accomplishments and they're all involved with changing consciousness and, and agape is the center of consciousness change. And that's why this is the necessary time. Wake up, forgive them. They didn't even know what the hell they were doing in the first place, but we got to offer a new awareness and a new education and especially with the children because once they get programmed, that's their life until they change the program. And this is a time of program change. Absolutely. Everything, yeah. everything is in flux. Everything is, the world of phenomena is moving so fast and everything is in flux that we can actually begin to participate in the direction where we want it to go. That's why this time is so exciting and so beautiful, even though it appears to be negative. Now you said a lot, and I know we have to end, but this is why you know psychologists say that an African American boy, by the time he's seven years old, has already developed psychological antibodies against racism, because he's been seen as the other for seven years. So he's already developed a, a shell, and so um, as as you're saying, that is why we have to do the work in consciousness as well as march, demonstrate, legislate work to change the narrative, have the conversations, justice, reform. Um, you, I mean, black lives matter, but black dollars matter as well <laughs> in terms of how we spend them in order to make a difference on the planet. I mean, there's, there's a lot here to unpack. I'll just say this, because I know Kelly's going to want to have to kick us off pretty soon. But um, first there is, you know, it's like this, like four stages. There's like the protest, the demonstrations, pushing the needle. Then there has to be a vision of where we're going. That's the beloved community. We have to describe it. We have to describe the best case scenarios in the justice system, the legal system, policing, healthcare rather than sick care, the prison industrial system being transformed from mass incarceration uh, to uh, uh, you know, a, a way that we're rehabilitating and, and giving people their dignity back. We have to have a vision of all of that. Then the strategy to get there. Then there's implementation. 
So right now we're pushing the needle and bringing, making everybody conscious that these are the issues. But the visionaries now have to begin to describe where we're going. Dr. King did a really good job in describing him and James Lawson and you know the beloved community. This is what it looks like. And we, did, we have to go into the structures. This is what it looks like. Strategy and then implementation. So we have to keep our fire during this moment of great evolution and great transformation. Yes. Yes. And um, uh, one of the things I would like to remind people as, as they leave is uh, oh, no. um, that we all must work for change. Oh, am I off again? Yeah, you go, you're on. We, you're we, on. we must all pray for change. OK, we must pray for change. We must work for change. And lastly, we all must be the change. Because if love has not yet won, then the battle is not yet over. That's right. Amen. Love that. Uh, I lost Andrea's picture. Do you still see her, everyone? I see her. Are you doing? Okay. Okay, great. Um, yeah, and so there was there were some comments on the side about some of the connection issues. Um, we have recorded this and we will we will make it available for people to rewatch if you missed something or got bumped off. There was a lot of people here today, 10,000 people. Um, and just thank you again so much, everybody. Um, just, yeah, be, be the change, educate yourself, listen, learn, vision, love, um, and, and just thank you so much for, for Bruce, Andrea, Michael, for being here. Andrea, you're on the East Coast. Uh, so thank you for staying up late for us. And thank you everybody around the globe for for being part of the conversation um, so you two can can be the light worker and, and help us shift for good. Um, thanks, guys. Absolutely. Anyone, last words? You know, you know Kelly, I, I, Kelly, I would suggest that they actually listen to this last Sunday's talk at Agape, yes. that, that nine o'clock talk, because it, it, it gives a context for a lot that we're going through right now. Does. Yeah, his 9.30, uh, go to agapelive.com and, and check out the, the streaming archives for mm -hmm. Reverend Michael's service um, yesterday, June 7th at 9.30 a.m. 9, 9, 9 a.m. 9 a.m., 9 a.m. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and, and your new app, check out Beckwith Inspires, uh, right? Michael? Yeah, they can go to michaelbbeckwith.tv and just subscribe to the app and then go to the app store and get Beckwith Inspires. And it's free. They can sign up for free. Yeah. Continuing inspiration so we can keep this momentum moving forward. Bruce? Uh, just if I can, last thing. Yeah. Um, as we've been talking about, consciousness is really involved with creating this change. And I want to bring up again a quantum physics phrase and then give it a meaning. The phrase is the field is the sole governing agency of matter. The field is the invisible energy that shapes the matter that we are. Consciousness is a field. And what's interesting is I can put wires on your head. I can read your consciousness, what's going on inside your head. That's the brain reading, EEG. But there's a new device called magnetoencephalograph that reads brain function. But the point about it is the probe is out here. <laughs> and it's reading brain function in here. Most important point of that understanding is this. Your thoughts are not contained in your head. Right. Your thoughts are broadcast into the field. Everyone's head is like a tuning fork with a broadcast. The more harmony, the more people sharing that harmony and that consciousness, the more tuning forks, the more amplitude power. Yep. And that's what changes the world. Yep. Your consciousness is not hiding in here. It's altering what's going on out here. Right. And that's why uh, Andrea, Michael, uh, your efforts to dive into let's get this consciousness up on a higher level is fundamental because it will be broadcasting a healthier energy field to shape the world in which we live. You're speaking yeah. my language, Bruce. That's why I tell people, if you think a group of people sitting in meditation are doing nothing, you don't understand quantum physics or non-locality or mysticism because yeah. that is what changes the world. And a small percent, 0.1 percent of the population with the same tuning yes. will change the world. Absolutely. Uh, and that's so hopeful because, as I said before, I get so overwhelmed with how are we going to change these 
dinosaurs and this this deep seated uh, belief in systemic racism and and beyond all of the issues we have. But if we understand the field and if we understand that energy determines and organizes matter, then we shift our consciousness, we shift our energy and the structures and our society will shift as a result. So that's it. And there we can leave you guys. Thank that's you all so much. So it is. And Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank all of you, all of the listeners. Thank you. Yes.